Hello and welcome to Toolbox Webisode 6. Today we are continuing our Distress Tolerance module and continuing on with Self-Soothe and Improve. So what we do, this webinar series is sponsored by Youth Eastside Services. We provide behavioral health services to children and youth in Ace King County, ages birth to 22. Um, and we are a lifeline for kids and families coping with challenges like emotional distress, substance abuse, and violence. If you are interested in services with us, we definitely have those. Um, so we do youth and family mental health counseling, as well as substance use and co-occurring counseling, um, and as well community education and prevention programs, which are other programs that Delaney and I actually come from with YES. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us to explore service options, we are currently offering in-person and virtual services. You can feel free to follow that link um, if you want to explore options for virtual services. If you'd like to inquire about in-person services, another great way to reach us is through our number. That number is up there on the slide. Um, and you are also welcome to follow us on any social media you would like. If you'd like to reach out to someone else, if you're experiencing a crisis um, and need to talk to someone right now, maybe not something that really reaches up to 911, but something that you could use someone to talk to right now, a good number to call is the King County Crisis Line. They are open 24 seven and you can call anytime to get some emotional support um, or even just hear about programs in your area that might be helpful in a crisis. Um, crisis Text Line is also open 24 seven. You can text HOME to 741-741 and reach out to a crisis counselor that way. Um, or for our youth that might be listening, um, Team Link is a great option. They're open from six to 10 p.m. every single night of the year. Um, and that way you can reach another team for support instead of an adult in case having someone close to your age might be a little bit more comfortable. Um, I am Kaylin Griffith. I'm a behavioral health support specialist and I'm a licensed mental health counselor and substance use disorder trainee. And I am Delaney Nonierst. I am the school-based behavioral health coordinator and I'm a social worker by training and a substance use disorder professional. And we are both foundationally trained in dialectical behavior therapy. And for all of the materials that we are presenting in all of this webinar, um, we took from these two resources. So the DBT Skills in Schools textbook, as well as DBT Skills Training Manual. If you're interested in the kinds of lessons that we're teaching, feel free to go check out both of these resources to learn a little bit more. All right, so for today's agenda, um, we are gonna go do mindfulness, because as always, it's a practice we are trying to learn and implement into our daily lives. We're going to review distress tolerance since that's the unit we are in. Uh, the skills we are going to learn today are self-soothe and improve. As always, we give you some at-home practice. If you are following along with us on the recording, make sure you download the handout that comes along with this. You can also download the slides, um, but you can follow along with that and set your own goals and kind of take your own notes uh, as well as get that at-home practice for you. Uh, and then of course, we will wrap it up with a Q&A. We do not currently have any participants attending at the moment, but if we do, uh, we will answer questions or feel free to join us next time if you do have questions you'd like to ask in person and we are on week six of 16 total so the whole theme of this webinar is building a toolbox so if you look at the screen so far these are the ones that we have gone over so our first unit was mindfulness um, and those are the skills that we have learned so if you missed any or need a refresher you can always go back and check out those videos and we are currently in the distress tolerance unit. So last week we covered accepts and tip, and this week we are doing self-soothe and improve. So our idea is that you have not only one or two skills that you can use, but a plethora of them because part of DBT is doing what works and being efficient in that. And some of these skills might work for you and they might not work for me, or they might work for Kaylin and they might not work for a student or a parent that you know. So the idea is to give you as many as you can for as many different situations as you might need. Um, so kind of picking what works for you. And we are going to do a bit of mindfulness. Um, so I am going to share my screen and pull up a video for you. Uh, the video that we're showing today goes over the 54321 grounding technique. We have mentioned it a few times in previous uh, webinars. Uh, it's a really great tool that I like to always talk about with students because it's something that you can do in class and nobody will really notice. Um, so I, I like using it for that. Uh, and so I'm going to share a video that kind of goes over some of the psychoeducation of that, but also kind of walks through the practice as well. So um, you can follow along with us there. And like always, like we said, we want to give you as many different options and tools as applicable. So here is another one. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna from Franklin County Cares and Lutheran Family and Children's Services. And now, I'm not really a superhero, but 
I thought it would be fun. This is the first video in our grounding series, and today I will be introducing you to the 54321 method. So, what is grounding anyway? Well, it's a set of simple techniques that you can use to detach yourself from difficult emotions like anxiety, sadness, or anger. Grounding provides a healthy distraction to prevent you from being overwhelmed by emotion while still paying attention to your body's cues and senses. You know the brain fog that comes on when you get stressed about a task you have to complete and how that fog gets in the way of completing that task? Well, this method can help you. And that's because this method works on getting you out of the amygdala where emotions can take over and into your prefrontal cortex. So let's get started. Here's a breakdown of the steps in this method. We'll go through them quickly now, and then we can talk about each step in a little bit more detail. This method uses sensory exploration to distract your mind from whatever is upsetting you. You will identify five things you see, four things you feel, three things you hear, two things you smell, and one thing you taste. First, we are going to focus on five things we see. Don't overthink this. Just find five things in the room. Maybe it's the bookshelf across the room or your cat staring out the window. It doesn't really matter what five things you choose. Just make sure you choose five. Describe them in detail, either out loud or in your head. Take that cat by the window, for instance. What is it doing? What color is it? Does it have long hair or short hair? Is it asleep or is it awake? Is it licking its fur? Maybe it's eating. Describe it. The next step is to focus on four things you can feel. Maybe you can focus on the chair you are sitting on. Is it soft and fuzzy or hard and cold? Or maybe you can think about your shirt. How does the fabric feel? Do you feel hot or do you feel cold? How does the carpet feel under your feet? Now we will focus on three things we can hear. Can you hear a dog barking outside or Maybe your dog is barking at the door. Do you hear a car starting up or driving down your street? Maybe it is completely silent around you and you can just hear your own heartbeat. Focus on the sounds. Next thing is two things you can smell. Now, hopefully you have some pleasant smells around you. Uh, maybe you have a fresh pie in the oven. <laughs> I know, I know. That doesn't happen very often at my house either. One thing I smell a lot though is fresh laundry. So what does that smell like? Now this last one just so happens to be my favorite because we get to focus on one thing you can taste. Maybe you have a piece of chocolate or your favorite soda. I want you to savor whatever it is. Then think of words to describe the flavor as if you're trying to tell someone that has never had it before. As I talked about previously, we can use this technique to distract our minds from whatever negative emotion seems to be taking over in that moment, whether you're feeling sad, worried, angry, or even scared. So use this whenever and however much you need to. And that's it. This video was brought to you by Franklin County Cares, the Franklin County Community Resource. All right. Yeah, so that is using quite a few skills actually that we've talked about thus far in our DBT toolbox. Um, one of them is the describe skill. That is a mindfulness skill uh, in terms of just looking at things and describing them. What color are they? What do you think about it? What is it? How would you describe? Uh, I know a lot of times with describe people, we'll talk about if you were an alien describing it to someone who had never um, had it before, you know, never had it before. Like if you were an alien or you were describing it to an alien, what would that, what words would you use? Um, is there any other skills that you saw in there, Kaylin, that I'm not thinking of or picking up on? I think one mindfully was in that one too, um, which is technically a how skill. So you can do it at the same time that you do the describe skill. Um, but one mindfully, like really focusing on the things that you pick out in the room or in your area. Um, Cause the idea behind a grounding technique is it's supposed to get you out of your emotions, out of like whatever context it was that you were in that was really upsetting. And it's supposed to be something that shoves you like the video said back into your prefrontal cortex. Um, so I think one mindfully was definitely in that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. So that's an option that you can use. Um, I know the taste one is a little bit tough, especially if you're in class, but I always think it's if people like having mints or gum or something else that you can carry around with them that you can subtly, subtly eat or um, experience that that can be helpful too.
Absolutely. All right. So we are going to very, very quickly review distress tolerance again, which is the unit that we started last week. Um, but distress tolerance is all about learning to bear pain skillfully. Um, so what we do when we respond to pain, because pain is a natural and necessary part of life. It's something that we cannot avoid. Um, and you know, pain is always gonna be there. And it's really about choosing what we do when we notice that, because if we choose to sit in that, that kind of is suffering. And the idea that suffering is a choice is something that not a, people, a lot of people like to talk about. And it kind of is a choice. You can choose to sit there in that pain or you can choose to use your skills and try and find something else or feel a different way. Um, so learning to tolerate urges to act from emotion mind um, or use to get through a bad situa situation without making it worse. Two types of distress tolerance skills. Again, like last week, we're gonna be focusing on those crisis survival skills today. Um, so what the things are that you can do to make a short-term crisis um, without making things worse. Um, and then later on in the series, we'll be talking about reality acceptance skills. So those skills meant for kind of longer term distressing situations where you can't change those or fix those. Um, so in those, in those cases, like something where you can tolerate that distress and just accept reality for what it is, is gonna be more helpful. But more on that in a couple of weeks. Just a quick review, how do you know if you're in a crisis? It's highly stressful, it's short term, it's something that maybe came on really, really suddenly and maybe isn't gonna be around for too long. Um, and you feel intense pressure to resolve the crisis right now. Um, and I really liked this comic, so I kept it in here because I think it does a really good job of illustrating like what exactly is going on when you're experiencing a crisis. Um, you are shut down to reason mind, you are not listening to it, you are not accepting help from reason mind, and you're functioning almost fully in emotion mind. So you can use these skills when you have intense pain that cannot be helped quickly. Uh, you wanna act on your emotions, but it'll only make things worse. Emotion mind threatens to overwhelm you and you need to stay skillful or you need some input from reason mind at the same time and wise mind, most likely. You're overwhelmed yet demands must be met. So you need to do something um, even though you're overwhelmed and your emotional arousal is extreme but your problems can't be solved immediately or your emotional arousal is too extreme to be able to do the things effectively to solve the problem. So again, visiting our thermometer, what we're talking about with a crisis is not something that happens every day. If it's happening every single day, you might feel like you're in a crisis and those things absolutely are distressing. And some of these skills might not give you the same benefit as they would for things that don't happen as often. Um, in those cases, if a crisis is happening every day, it might be that more problem solving skills need to be used or reaching out for others for more help might need to be used. Um, but for our crisis survival skills, the ones that we're learning in this distress tolerance unit, um, we are thinking about an emotional scale of over about 65, where 65 to 100 is really, really emotionally escalated and really up there. So the first skill that we're gonna use and talk about today is self-soothe. Um, I co-facilitate a DBT group at UC Side Services, and this, for some reason, is just like one of the most popular um, skills that we use. Uh, oftentimes, when we go through this, we have students uh, create a self-soothe kit. Um, so as I go through this, I'll also add some examples with that and how I've used that in the past. Um, but what we're going to do is think about the six sort of senses or um, sensations, I guess, because movement isn't necessarily a sense, but vision, smell, touch, hearing, taste, and movement. So wanting to find something of those things to help you get out of that moment. Again, it's a grounding technique. So we're getting out of that crisis emotional state uh, and trying to get into our prefrontal cortex by again, describing things, seeing things, and intentionally doing things that help de-escalate us when we're in that crisis moment. So again, one of our skills that we learned in mindfulness is doing things non-judgmentally. So if you notice judgments come up when we're going through this, or when you try to use this skill, like saying you don't deserve to be soothed or you haven't earned it, acknowledge those thoughts and then let them go because um, judgments are just thoughts. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily true. And in fact, most of the time, judgments are not true. We talked about sort of the discriminating and then the evaluating. Discriminating judgments, again, we need them because they help tell us things like what is against the law, what's not against the law, what will make me sick if I eat it, what won't make me sick if I eat it. And then the evaluating thing is sort of what we use with judgments, right, of, of things are good or bad. 
um, where thoughts are not necessarily good or bad, they're just thoughts and you just let them go. So the first one is vision. So some options you can do are go to your favorite place, take in the sights, look at a photo album, notice colors in a sunset. What I usually do when I'm demonstrating this for students is I go to Google and I go to Google images and I say, all right, what's one of your favorite cute animals or what's something that you like to look at? I like to look at clouds. Um, sometimes here in Washington, it's just gray up there, um, but I like to look at calming pictures of clouds. One of my favorite things, if you ever need a pick me up is uh, snow leopards will self soothe by holding their tails in their mouths. It is really cute and adorable. And I also love that snow leopards self soothe. Uh, so I like to look at pictures of snow leopards holding their tails in their mouth. Um, so feel free to Google that when you need a, a pick me up. Uh, hearing, uh, playing your favorite music. This is a huge one, especially for youth. I also think it's a huge one for adults, but youth use, tend to use it a lot, lot more than adults. And in fact, actually, I think I need to use it more. Um, but listening to music, music also that will intentionally elevate your mood, not listening to music that will make it worse um, or listening to music that'll help kind of let it out, right? But things that'll intentionally elevate. So again, if we're thinking about creating maybe a self-soothe kit, that could be a playlist that you listen to. Um, also paying attention to nature sounds that can be really soothing for folks. You can go to YouTube and find something like that. Um, there's also a lot of ambient mixing sounds that I've found and that are fun to listen to. Um, or if you are musically inclined, you could play an instrument because that's also going to be part of that mindfulness practice of participating. Uh, and you're kind of only going to be able to play an instrument one mindfully. It's going to be a little bit hard to think about other things uh, and play an instrument at the same time. Uh, the next one is smell. Uh, so putting on your favorite lotion, light a scented candle, um, make cookies or other comfort food, things that smell nice to you. Uh, I know folks like essential oils can be a thing. Um, candles are a really big one. You don't even need to light them. You can just smell them. Uh, I know a lot of students do that. They'll put like a candle um, or maybe like coffee beans that you can smell. What is something that you like to smell that you can put in a self-soothe kit to sort of help take you out of that distressing moment? Um, smell is a really big one. Smells also are really connected to memory too. So if you have a favorite smell that can associates with a memory, that's a great one to try. Taste, uh, again, this can go with smell if you're making your favorite meal. Um, what Eating something that's your favorite food or your drink, treating yourself to a dessert that you want as a reward. Also to just mindfully eat. If you are eating something like dinner, just only be eating dinner and focusing, what does this taste like? If I was trying to describe this to someone who's never eaten it before, what are some words that I might use? Uh, eating can be a really great thing that can also help, help soothe us. Um, we don't often think about that. So again, small things you can do is mints or gum or you know chocolate if that's your thing or something small, snack. Also, I think when I'm emotionally distressed, I can get hangry. So you know, eating is always helpful for me. Um, touch options with here. You can take a long bath or a shower, cuddle with your pet if you have one, uh, get a massage. That seems Maybe sometimes out of reach for some folks, but that can be something you can schedule intentionally. Uh, brushing your hair, putting on PJs, whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable um, and it can be soothing. I've seen a lot of really great things with, you know, fidget toys um, for touch, something that you can fiddle with to distract yourself. I've seen a lot of really cool things too. They're like these little strips that people will stick on like their laptops that are some sort of sensory that they can, they can touch um, that that will be calming to them. Uh, so whatever it might be for you, uh, what is that that you can you can focus on? And then movement, uh, as always, exercise is something that is helpful, just movement in general, whatever that might look like for you. It could be going for a run. I absolutely hate running, so that is not mine or my go-to one. Uh, but doing yoga or some sort of Pilates, you can find YouTube videos that are really great. Um, you know, rocking yourself gently, dancing, uh, just doing the Superman pose. Is that, you wrote this, Kaylin, but is that just like the hands on your hips? Yeah. Like, yeah. I I'm typically show them to like boost performance. So it's really, really good, especially before like a test or something that's really anxiety producing because it like, it stimulates, I want to say the vagal nerve in your central nervous system uh -huh. where it like actually gives you confidence. Yeah, I've heard that too, that if, um, I think they talk about that in acting, like there's just something also about standing on a stage and doing that or doing the like this motion, that that is also helpful and boosting, boosting things like that. So what is it that you can do with movement? Is it just going for a walk? Is it even just like getting up from wherever you are? Um, that can help too as well, help soothe you. Absolutely.
All right, so that one is a fairly simple skill, so we went through that pretty quickly. This one is also a rather simple skill, um, and both of these ones you might find as you're watching this really consist of us like brainstorming things for you to try and then just using them. Um, I think something just to say about self-soothe and improve in particular is that likely some of y'all, if not all of you, are using some of these things already. And again, we mentioned this, I want to say, in the first couple weeks of this these webisodes, um, but this is not about us thinking that you don't know these skills or don't use them. It's about kind of restructuring behaviors that you already do as skillful, giving yourself the self-compassion of being like, no, I am actually doing something that really will improve this moment for me. Ooh, pun not intended. I guess it's been working its way into my brain. Um, anyway, so improving the moment is another acronym about replacing immediate negative events or the immediate surroundings that you're in with more positive ones. Using imagery, meaning, prayer, relaxation, one thing in the moment, vacations, and encouragement. And we'll go into each of those a little bit more in the next slides. So imagery. Imagery is really about picturing yourself in a place where you want to be. Um, so there are actually quite a few mindfulness meditation scripts where you, it's called guided visualization, but it will actually be a script of someone just describing a scene that you're supposed to picture yourself in. So for anyone out there who really likes audiobooks or podcasts or just like that extra voice kind of describing things for you that helps with your imagination, um, finding some of those scripts might be really helpful for this, but just imagining you're in a safe space you can immediately go to or picture yourself using skills. Uh, mentally rehearse these things in non-crisis moments because when you rehearse them, when you're in a calmer state of mind, it makes it significantly easier to try and do these things when you are in an escalated state of mind. Because um, again, mindfulness is really, really hard when you're emotionally escalated. And it's all about that practice, being able to put your mind where you want it to be, despite whatever distractions are going on around you. For meaning, it's about finding or creating meaning. So the silver lining, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. It's really about finding what is the helpful thing that I might get out of this? What is the lesson that I might learn out of this? Um, and I think that's in particular, one of the ones that will work for some people and not everyone. Because um, I know for some people, when someone tries pointing out the silver lining in something and they're really not ready to see it, it can feel really invalidating. Um, so this is one that I might try and see. It might be one that you try with other people too. But you know, listen to that feedback. Listen to what it does to your emotions when you do those things or when you make those kinds of statements for yourself. Listen to the judgments that you make. Um, because, you know, even if we do make those automatic good or bad value judgments, sometimes the fact that our brain automatically jumped to one of those is a good clue that we might not like it. So noticing that judgment, maybe rephrasing it with some described skills um, and thinking what that means for you about that meaning making. Prayer is also going to be one that will work for some people and not for everyone. I do want to emphasize, though, this is not necessarily prayer that's meant to be spiritual or religious based. Um, really, it's about asking for the strength and wisdom to tolerate the pain of the moment rather than doing anything around like wishing the pain would go away. Like sitting there and being like, hey, you know, I really wish I could tolerate this pain. And I want to have the strength to tolerate this pain. It can be something as simple as that. Um, and really hoping for that or wishing for that or praying for that, if you are religious or spiritual, um, can be really, really helpful in the moment too. Can make you kind of feel like there's something or someone out there that maybe has your back. Relaxation is a pretty self-explanatory one, but find an activity that will relax you. Take a nap, sit in the bath, do a crossword, go sit out in the sun, sunbathe for a little bit. Um, Put on your sunscreen though, because don't sunbathe forever because that will be bad for your skin. Um, but do things that you know will help you find relaxation or give you a setting of relaxation if you're having trouble finding relaxation just in your own body. One thing in the moment is really going back to mindfulness, um, but throwing yourself entirely into doing just one thing. If you have chores that you need to do, throw yourself into doing the dishes. Notice the water going over your hands. Notice how it feels to like have soap on your fingers or like slippery things or using a sponge to rub off like gritty things on a plate. Um, throw yourself into like an activity that you have. If you are driving somewhere, focus entirely on the road. Focus on like what cars you're seeing in front of you. Focus on brake lights as you see them. Um, look in the horizon. Figure out what you can do that you can throw all of your attention on. So maybe it can't be on that thing that you were originally distressed about. 
vacations are about just taking breaks. And importantly with breaks, you need to plan a start time and an end time. That vacation needs to end for us to be effective with getting our work and our goals done. Um, so taking breaks is really, really important for giving your mind just a mental rest. So it doesn't have to process something for a minute so it can focus on something completely different and come back a little bit more revitalized. And again, vacations can really, really easily turn into a slippery slope where all of a sudden it's been several hours and you haven't come back to the thing. A vacation is not you giving yourself an excuse to just do something else and forget about it. A vacation really is like, hey, I need a minute. I can't do this thing right now and I'll come back to it later when I can. And giving yourself the self-compassion of one, I can take a break and come back to the thing and be just fine. And two, I am responsible enough to do that for myself. Um, so being able to choose this as something that's gonna be helpful and effective is a really helpful choice sometimes. And lastly, encouragement. I really like this one, but talk to yourself the way you would talk to someone you really care about or someone that you're really proud of or someone you have a lot of faith in. Um, talk to yourself the way you would like your best friend or a parent that you really love or a really trusted adult. Because the thing is, you are the only person who's going to be with you for your entire life. You might as well treat yourself with kindness. And the thing is, you are, if you are using this skill, you are using your skills and trying your best to get through the thing. One of the major dialectics in DBT is you are trying the best that you can and you need to try harder. So encouraging yourself when you've noticed those times where maybe you do need to try a little bit harder is not saying you weren't trying at all. It really is acknowledging the progress that you've made and then being like, so let's go a couple steps further. So <laughs> hey, yeah, very short week. It is it is a short short um, web webisode I guess today because it's a lot of a lot of like here's how you can do it and then you just gotta go do it. There's not a whole lot that we can sort of demo for you other than give you our ideas. Um, so for our at home practice, um, we're encouraging you again download that handout, but write down ideas for practicing at least two of the specific improved skills during the week when you feel upset for whatever reason. Um, again, I always talk about having a, a plan, right? An emergency plan. If the fire alarm goes off right now, I know Kaylin and I are in our homes, but if the fire alarm goes off right now, we know what to do. We exit the building. Why do we know that? We learned it and we practiced it because, you know, before they had fire alarms, people would die in fires and they were like, hey, we don't want that to happen anymore. And the best time to practice. What? You don't <laughs> want that to happen anymore? No, they don't want it to happen anymore. And the best way to practice is when you're not escalated. So the best way to think about these things is when you're not escalated. So what are some things that you have available? You can think about this ahead of time so that when you are, you can look at the list and go, okay, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, when there is a fire, this is what I'm supposed to do. And also practice it when there's not a fire. Like, okay, great. I'm feeling okay right now, but I'm going to practice some of these things so that when I'm not feeling great, I think about it. Because again, when we're not feeling great, we have a hard time. We're in sort of a different brain. We're in our emotion mind instead of our, our reason mind or wise mind. And we're going to be thinking about doing things and acting on urges that we don't want to do. So practicing that beforehand. So write down what are some two, some things that you would want to use during the week. Um, just and then when that happens, describe the stressful situation you were in and when you chose to practice your skills. So what is it that came up for you? How did you use it? Um, what, and then ultimately, you know, how did it help you? Uh, did it help with uh, coping with uncomfortable feelings and urges or avoid conflict of anything? If yes, describe how it helped. If no, describe why you believe it did not help. Again, we're thinking about doing things effectively. It could work for you again, and it could not work for you. So again, the idea is testing it and figuring it out because there's probably also nothing worse than being like, I'm gonna use this skill. And then in the moment finding out, oh wait, that didn't really actually work as well as I wanted it to. Um, or maybe that wasn't the best choice I could have made. Now I can make a different one. So, so practicing it. And then bro, do you even track your emotions? Um, one of the things that we've been talking about throughout this webisode is again, checking in and tuning in with yourself. One of the things I always talk about the students that I work with is if you want to change something, first, we got to know what it is that we're trying to change. We can't just start doing things willy nilly. Um, you know, think about how it is in science class. You have a hypothesis and we want to observe things first before we start making changes. So how is it that you can track your mood and your skills that you use throughout the week? Because that's going to show you gaps. It's going to show you patterns. It's going to show you what are things that maybe upset me. Like for me, example, um, 
I usually have a hard time sleeping before big meetings. So we sometimes have our, we have quite a few meetings on Fridays in our team. And sometimes I have a hard time sleeping before that. So what are some things that I can do uh, to plan for that now that I've seen that? What are some skills that I can use? Uh, and it'll give you a better idea of, of what it is that you need to try out. So there's lots of apps that you can do this. You can also create a notes page Again, doing whatever works for you. Uh, on the next slide, we have, I took a snippet of this. At YES, we have diary cards is what we call them for DBT. Uh, and we usually give these out to clients and you can use this to track, okay, what is it that I used? These are the ones for survival and acceptance, which again is distress tolerance. Um, it's not exactly, well, it's distress, yeah, it's right there, distract, self-soothe, improve the moment, um, number 26. You can kind of use this to see, okay, yeah, on Monday I used this skill, or maybe, you know, it gets to Saturday and you're like, wow, I haven't circled anything. What's kind of been going on? What, what did I do? What did I not do? Um, so figuring out what works best for you to track it, because it's going to just give you more information and also help remind you to use skills when you need to. There's also a fun hint that we do not cover all of the skills in DBT in this webisode. So if you're noticing as we throw screenshots of these diary cards up here that you're kind of interested in hearing what some of those other skills are, feel free to join us for a Q&A in the future, or feel free to check out the materials from DBT. But we currently still have no one with us today live. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and skip our Q&A portion just to save a little bit of time for anyone who might be joining us on the recording. Um, but if y'all would like to reach out to us to schedule any kind of services, we are offering in-person and virtual services. The information is on this slide. Um, and as well, you are welcome to follow us on any of our social media handles as you would like. Um, you can also reach out to someone else for any kind of immediate crisis where you want to talk to someone right now. Um, but for those crises, obviously, that are appropriate for 911, go ahead and give 911 a call. But for those step down crises, uh, maybe they're emotional crises or things interpersonal that you need just someone to talk to about. Um, the King County Crisis Line is a great resource. The Crisis Text Line is also a great resource. Those are both 24-7. Um, or you can contact Team Link um, for our teens in the audience who might be listening. That is open from 6 to 10 p.m. every single night of the year um, and is answered by other teens. So you can talk to someone who's a little bit closer to your own age. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Thanks.